Hello there, my name is Joe Martin. I'm pastor at First Baptist in Toledo, Washington. I want to um, take a few weeks to talk about, during these cabin talks, to revisit the series Why Church. A lot of people have asked me about it and commented about it, and I wanted to revisit the material for you who missed it, um, who were not in church during that time, in, physically in the um, gathering on Sunday. You know, it dawned on me in the middle of all this that most of you and most of the people who need this conversation are actually <laughs> not in the church building. They're, they're not there. And so I wanted to um, do this in little pieces so that you could watch it on your own in a different context, in a, a little bit repa- a little bit of re- different version, like it's just me talking to you. I wanted to present this conversation to you who are not here, or maybe you can't be here, and I think sometimes we forget that. There's some of you that because of health issues or transportation issues, or there's a lot of you that just live in different places. You're maybe, um, you know, in the winter in different places. You're not here. Um, um, you're, you're not able to be. And for some of you that are physically not present, and then there's others of you who are, are just not going to church right now for a bunch of reasons. I think a lot of people have been through that. So I want to just start by just kind of breaking this down, and I'll try to not make these too long. I do want you to be able to go to our website and maybe leave a message or a comment, but I do want to talk about the three parts of this series of teachings. One, number one, why church? or why T- And then secondly, why TFBC or maybe any local church that you could be a part of? And then why you? What's your part in it? Why is it important for you to be part? So let's talk, start by revisiting again why church, because it's a really fair question. We're living in an era, the biggest um, spiritual or religious shift in the history of the United States right now, but it's not the Great Awakening or the Second Great Awakening. It's this Great Unawakening as far as Christianity is concerned. It's what they call the Great Dechurching. Approximately 40 million people have answered this question, why church, by saying, I'm not going to do it. They're de-churching. And it might, you might be one of those folks. And uh, you might have a number of reasons, um, uh, you know, or, or maybe you don't have a lot of reasons but uh, you, uh, that you've really thought through. But the fact is that for all practical purposes, you're really not, um, you don't really attend church much. And even if you think of yourself as a part of a church, you're not really actively involved in the cult, the community or the culture of that local church. And um, the top reasons, uh, we'll talk about that, why people find themselves dechurched. Um, the good news is that of those 40 million people that once went to church, grew up in church, were members of a church, some of them serving in churches, some of them in ministry, 51% of them said they would return or were very interested in returning if they could, if the situation was different or if they could find a community that was a good fit. Because many of the reasons uh, people left and the top reasons were they didn't feel like they fit in. And maybe you felt that way. Um, That's possible. Um, or you doubted God's existence. Some people come to that. You go through really difficult things or you go through a kind of existential intellectual crisis and nobody answers those questions in a way that was satisfactory for you. And so you doubt the existence of God. You know, one of the main reasons why people de church is they just get other priorities. They get different priorities in their life as they go through different stages Um, Another big reason was um, uh, they disagreed with the politics of their particular church or they disagreed with the um, um, one way or the other. They wanted a church that had a singularity of politics that agreed with their particular view. But you know, one of the number one reasons why people have the church is just inconvenient. It's one of the top three reasons. And this could be kids. It could be work. Another big factor is travel sports was another big reason. 
uh, it's not intentional, but your kids are involved in the sports and maybe they're pretty good and somebody invites them to be on a travel team and then pretty much a huge part of your year and your budget <laughs> is tied up in travel sports. Other people, it was a bad church experience that de churched them. Or they say, people will say this, my parents made me go and I didn't want to. And, you know, that's often, sometimes people go through a divorce and it's very awkward from the church they came from. Or maybe it wasn't dealt with well. Or maybe you have different sexual ethics and you disagree with uh, your particular church or the church's view on, on sex and marriage and etc. Or maybe another huge reason that people have de-churched is they moved. They moved to a new place. They established a new life, and churches wasn't a part of it, and then it was a Sunday brunch. Clergy scandals, uh, examples of racism, um, and a lot of people, and a lot of you, I know that are listening to this because I run into you, COVID just got you out of the habit. Um, it, it's a big thing, and then you get out of the habit. Um, good habits are really hard to keep, and bad habits are really easy to step into you hypocrisy in the church like you saw this and people are saying one thing and then they do something else and there's a lot of that and it happens we can all uh, fail in that way and sometimes it's just your friends are not attending church anymore or you don't have friends at church you don't have people with common interests but but if you're sitting there and maybe it's you but you already know a lot of people who you went to church with that you know for a fact that they don't attend or seem to believe much of anything anymore. And maybe you feel this way also at times. And if you are trying or you're kind of moving in this direction, or maybe you're trying to hang in there, maybe you're the only one in your family who's trying to hang in there, you wonder, did I miss something? Did I miss the memo? I feel like I've been kind of left behind by a lot of people that matter to me. So um, why church? is a question that is not a new question, and it is not a new problem. The early Christians, there was periods of de-churching at other times in history. In the very early church, you have to remember that originally all those early Christians, were, were those followers of Jesus, were Jewish. And then along came Paul, and Paul began to evangelize. Well, early on, even before Paul, there was the the... Samaritans, and then other individual Hellenistic Jews. But then Gentiles began to come in. People that came out of mystery, religions, and nothing, believing in all kinds of things. Um, and they came in by the droves. And Hebrew Christians, the people that came out of Judaism, who grew up thinking Gentiles, they, their whole life was built around the idea to keep separate from Gentiles. And they were threats, and they were unclean, and they were enemies of one type or the other they brought these they're they're coming into their community and they brought with them their cultural influences their language their food they had little knowledge of the the traditions of the of the old testament or the hebrew scriptures and so a lot of these jewish believers began to feel really uncomfortable and by the way there was a culture war in the church and it was before uh it, it happened before the turn of the century of this last century it started with greek speaking jews we see it as early as acts chapter 6 where the hellenistic jews felt like they were neglected and later it got worse and worse when absolute people that came completely out of you know out of paganism uh in the Roman mystery religions and the worship of all kinds of things, oracles came into the church and they repented, but they were, they were green as grass and they brought a lot of stuff with them that was uncomfortable for people who had not been raised that, even though they had been freed from the, um, the law in the sense of the ceremonial law and the dietary laws, the discomfort just got worse and worse. And so the pressure grew among these Hebrew Christians and the Judaistic Christians to pull back from the church. And a lot of them began to want to go back to Judaism. And that's why the book of Hebrews was given to co combat the drift, this massive de-churching. Hebrews 10.23, you hear the writer saying, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. In the whole book is written to say, Jesus is better 
then a better temple, a better sacrifice, a better priesthood all the way through. And he says, he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, our own assembling together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the, the, the writer was really saying, why church? You need each other. You need each other for a number of reasons. Why should you um, go to any church ever? Well, number one, he says, to avoid wavering. It's easy to get unsteady. One of the great risks as you get older is you begin to lose your, your, your small motor, motor uh, skills, you know, your, your muscle memory and your, you, you, you get unstable. And they say that one of the predictors of early death is if you can't stand on one leg, you begin to waver. Well, listen to what he said in Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. You know, you have a profession. Many of you that are listening to this, maybe you were saved. You've been, you, you were even baptized maybe in, in TFBC or somewhere else. You really confessed, your, you confessed Jesus as your master, as your Lord, that you're going to follow him and your Savior. Maybe it was as a child or at youth camp, or maybe it was of your own choice. But how many of you thought that are listening to me right now, you would get distracted? You're listening, maybe you, somebody sent this to you or whatever, but you never thought you'd get distracted. You never thought that you would later fall into doubt or unbelief or beginning to live your life like a practical atheist. Like maybe you go, there is a God, but you live like he doesn't exist. Nobody ever starts out this way. It's kind of like the first, uh, first, the first drink, you know, you feel fine, you get a little buzz going, but if you, you indulge you more and what happens, you begin to waver. <laughs> you can't walk the line, you get unsteady and you begin to lean to the point, not just of leaning, but of falling. And sometimes you pull a few people down with you. I wonder how often indulging this common belief that contributes to wavering um, and then leads later to departing from Jesus contributes to this. Here's what people say. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian and follow your faith. Let me say it again. This is a common belief. I wonder how much. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian and follow your faith. And so I, I put together, and I've used this in my classes and I've used this in church, what I call an anchor skills survey. This means it's a skill or an anchor practice survey. This is a practice that seems to anchor all the other practices. So um, let me ask you a question. You can just write it down. When was the last time you attended church weekly? How long has it been? Okay, did you write it down? Okay. Secondly, since you stopped attending a, a local church regularly, how much did your Christian practices, how, how much did your Christian practices drop off? You say, what do you mean by Christmas, Christian practices? Fixed hour of prayer that you have a set time for prayer. Spiritual reading, you read the Bible or you read things, devotional books. Tithing, giving your tithe in combination with other Christians as an act of worship to God and good to do good service of other people. You're, you're actively involved in serving people in, in your community, in your church, through your church and, um, witness you're sharing your faith with other people and about what Jesus has done in your life. So I ask you, since you quit attending regularly, how much has, have those practices dropped off in the, a percentage between, let's say, zero and 100%. Now, some of you are going to say, well, there's no change because where I was going or when I was going, I wasn't doing anything anyway. And it was my, the particular congregation I was a part of didn't encourage this. Okay. That's fair. And may have been a part of a community that just showing up was all that seemed to matter and they were just filling seats and wanted people to, that was it. But you may say, as almost everyone I have talked to up to this point, you may say, as they have, that about 80 to 90% has dropped off since I really began, since I have not attended church weekly. And that leads me to um, 
think about this is really an anchor practice according to what my experience is and what the Bible teaches. Now, you may be doing better right now, and you may recall a period like this when you were not attending regularly, and, um, and you dropped off. It seems that gathering, like I said, is that anchor practice. It is the regular practice of gathering bodily that reminds you of all the other practices to not waver, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So why church? To keep from wavering. Secondly, to encourage one another. That's why. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This is a word that's like, like um, it means a spur. For those of you that are equestrian, you know what that means. You know, there are 51 in other commands, 51 in other commands um, in the Bible. 59, actually. And there may be a few more. But did you know that almost all of them have to be done with other people in their presence? You know, Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to that which is good, um, be devoted to one another and brotherly love, give preference to one another and honor, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, reserving in tribulation, devoted in prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality, bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind to one another, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly, do not be wise in your own estimation, never pay back evil for evil to anyone, respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Why church? Because those one another commands and a bunch of other ones too. You can't do it on your on your own. And then the and that brings me to the third reason why church. Um, to learn loving, to learn how to love well. That's very important. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to what love, to love and good deeds. You know, it's easy to have un- expectations unknown to you isn't it it's like for example you get married and you think it's all this is great you know that you know you think that you'll never have any problems and that it's always going to be bliss it's always going to be the honeymoon and then you learn right that you have unrealistic expectations you have you have an illusion you have a in a kind of illusion about marriage and part of growing up is you've got to learn oh my illusion isn't really real they're real i don't I don't um, love the illusion of my wife I, or, or your husband. You love them. And that's a whole other proposition. Your kids, we have illusions about that. And we have expectations of church. We think people at church will always be happy and nice. I will have many close friends at church, which is nice, but you figure that isn't always true. I will be close, I will be close friends with the church staff and family. It helps to have friends at church. It really does. But that's not why you should go to a church, this church or any other church. I want to have friends, but that's not, that doesn't always happen. My kids will have fun at this church and get along with every other kid in church. Or some people say um, the reason they go to church the motive for going, their expectation is my wife makes me come and I want to keep her happy. Or maybe I go to church because it's entertaining. More and more resources are put on to keeping the show going on Sunday. But remember, Jesus made a point of picking people who would never ever be friends if it wasn't for him. Everyone agrees, you know, Jesus didn't pick people where everyone agreed. He picked enemies for family to bring them into being family. Simon the Zealot, Matthew the tax collector. Why church? You go to a church in person to love God enough to love others. You know, I believe affinities are powerful, but a great for about 40 years, church growth gurus have said, we're going to build church around affinities. It's quicker, it's faster, it's you fill seats quicker, you find everybody that likes this or everybody that likes that or everybody has this politic or everybody has this particular ethnicity and that's the way to do it. But you know what? That's exactly not what the Bible did. Affinities are powerful and they are, um, they're a good model for reaching customers as Google has taught us or Amazon has taught us how to sell jeans and air fryers and sportswear. But churches use affinities 
that use affinities to sell their seeds. Churches are are usually very uh, segregated racially, economically, age range. You don't have a mixture of range. You don't have cross-generational relationships. Political, they're all the same, one church or the other. This is not remarkable. We're supposed to be remarkable, but it is definitely marketable. The Holy Spirit always does something remarkable. That's why that Pentecost beginning, all those different 16 countries, different kinds of people, languages. The early church did not have affinity as you might expect. The disciples were very, very different. Remember Acts 2.5, now they were living in Jerusalem, devout men of every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. You know, um, he says, for all of you were baptized into one, into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Galatians uh, chapter 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus And if you belong to Christ, you are the Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. The vision from beyond time was this. It was not affinity. It was infinity. It was after the Revelation 7, 9. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne And before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What is remarkable is people who have one reason they gather together and stick together. They want to practice their master's command to love well. And that's what we aspire to be. We're not there yet. But we, and you know how you do that? Not forsaking our own assembling together is the habit. If you got in that habit, and some of you are, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are to gather at least each Sunday, considering how to stimulate, to spur, and to love and good deeds. We have to resist the temptation and distractions that cause us to forsake and leave behind and desert and to go to a better offer each other. And this will require an admission that your whole way of thinking about church and why you do it is going to have to change. Because we learn love by sticking together when it's hard and inconvenient. Love is loyal when it serves, when a need is greatest. So when you see weakness in your church, whether it's TFBC or another one, when you see something that needs to be done, love chooses to seek to meet the need with good deeds instead of complaining, leaving defecting. And this is so countercultural to our current consumer-based church growth culture. The current consumer-based growth promotes shallow discipleship that is neither loving nor faithful. So why church? To stop your wavering, to encourage one another, to learn to love well, and to provide a place for you to practice. So I want to encourage you to watch these um, talks over the next few weeks, make a commitment to wherever you are, to find a church, not a great church, not a perfect church, not a big show, some ordinary people in there with ordinary problems, ordinary preacher, maybe not even up to standard, or your standard, whatever that is. Make a commitment to this anchor practice. Gather in person with your church at least once a week. Practice is required in any area important for human flourishing. And this is not enough but it's a start to getting and staying focused. Go to a class if you can, and put your kids in a class if you can. One way to learn loving is through remembering the greatest love of all. We love this, that he laid, we know love by this. He laid down his life for the brethren and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Remember what Jesus said? This is our aspiration at TFBC. A new, that we would keep this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. It's a, it's a, that's a tough command. By this, he says, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We celebrate and remember how we are to love as a witness. That's our evangelistic base. So think about it. Think about this as you um, ponder the rest of your week. 
And I want you to um, take some time, maybe comment or ask a question or share your story. And also share how TFBC might do a better job at helping you be committed to a community of believers or to get back in to in-person experience with your church. Uh, We certainly have a lot to learn. We've made our share of mistakes. But just know we're really trying to love because what we want to do is be that unexplainable community that the one thing that pulls us together is Jesus. Thanks for watching this. And if you know somebody, they've been de-churched, or they've been out of church for, or almost de-churched, very seldom get there, just send this to them. Ask them to watch it. I look forward to it. Maybe I'll see you this weekend if you're within range. All right. God bless you.